years tonight as the Trump administration throws its full weight behind getting rid of Venezuelan strongman President Nicolas Maduro. And back here at home, President Trump and House Speaker Pelosi continue to feud over the State of the Union address. The president telling Speaker Pelosi he intends to deliver the speech in the House chamber. But Pelosi has other ideas, as well as, it seems, the final say on that particular venue. It is the latest saga in the fallout from the partial government shutdown, now 33 days old. We start our coverage tonight with Chief White House Correspondent John Roberts on the North Lawn. Good evening, John. Right, good evening to you. The language from Speaker Pelosi today was cordial and parliamentary, but the net effect was to tell President Trump, you're not welcome in my house. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. In a presidency that has seen its fair share of firsts, this truly was unprecedented. The Speaker of the House canceling her invitation to President Trump to deliver the State of the Union on January 29th. We have said very clearly from the start, uh, when I wrote to him the second time to say, since government is shut down, we do not, let's, let's work together on a mutually agreeable date when we can welcome you to the Capitol to get rid of the State of the Union address. The news didn't come as much of a surprise to the president. Uh, the State of the Union speech has been uh, canceled by Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't want to hear the truth. She doesn't want the American public to hear what's going on. Still, President Trump and called Pelosi's decision a, quote, horrible precedent. We will have a response to Nancy Pelosi in due course. But what she's doing to the American people, what she's doing to our Constitution is a disgrace. In a letter earlier in the day, President Trump called out Pelosi's now debunked claims that security concerns were the basis on which to delay the address. The president writing, I was contacted by the Department of Homeland Security and the United States Secret Service to explain that there would be absolutely no problem regarding security with respect to the event. In her response, Pelosi appeared to acknowledge that her decision was political, not mentioning security, instead saying, I am writing to inform you that the House of Representatives will not consider a concurrent resolution authorizing the President's State of the Union address in the House chamber until government has opened. With an address to Congress off, at least for the moment, the White House is now actively considering Plan B, an address somewhere outside of Washington. The president will talk to the American people on January 29th, as he does nearly every single day. Tomorrow, all eyes will turn to the Senate, which is attempting to move forward on ending the shutdown. Two measures to reopen government will be considered. One, the president's offer of DACA and TPS protection in exchange for money for a border barrier, the other a three-week spending measure with no money for the wall. We are hopeful uh, that the Senate will vote to open up the government of the United States. I think they're going to reject the president's plan. A new Fox News poll shows the majority of registered voters blame President Trump for the shutdown. And while 75 percent of registered voters also say the shutdown is an emergency or a major problem, 59 percent also say the situation at the border qualifies as one. If we did what we had to do, you would bring crime down in half in our country because so much of it comes through our southern border. Honduras is doing nothing for us. Guatemala is doing nothing for us. He's sending his letter to Speaker Pelosi this afternoon, or this morning, rather. President Trump put the ball deep into Pelosi's court. For Tuesday, or uh, cement in history, the very first time that a speaker has ever canceled the event. By choosing to do the latter, the president believes he has got some political mileage from all of this. Brett? Maybe, maybe you can invite them all to the White House. Who knows? <laughs> John, uh, Michael Cohen, president's former attorney, just postponed his schedule to congressional testimony because he said of threats from the But today, his spokesman, Lanny Davis, said that Cohen was postponing that appearance because of threats that the president and his attorney, Rudy Giuliani, have made against Michael Cohen and his family. Now, Davis would not elaborate on those threats, but the president has tweeted a couple of times about Michael Cohen's father-in-law, Fema Schusterman, suggested that he has been involved in some malign activities. Uh, Rudy Giuliani went so far as to say, without citing any evidence, that Schusterman may have some connections to organized crime. President Trump said this about Cohen's testimony earlier today. He's only been threatened by the truth, and uh, uh, he doesn't want to do that probably for me or other of his clients. 
he has other clients also, I assume, and uh, he doesn't want to tell the truth from me or other of his clients. Now, Lanny Davis did say that Cohen would come before the committee at the appropriate time at some future date. But with Cohen scheduled to go to prison on March the 6th, time is running short. However, the committee chairman, Elijah Cummings, said, quote, we will get the testimony as sure as night becomes day and day becomes night. Cummings indicating that he would be willing to get Michael Cohen out of jail for a day to get him before Congress. Brett? John Roberts, thank you. Turmoil in the streets of Venezuela today as protesters demand President Nicolas Maduro step down. And President Trump is taking the clearest step yet to show his support for their cause. He announced the U.S. is officially recognizing the head of the opposition-controlled Congress in Venezuela as that country's leader. But despite the upheaval, Maduro is not without his supporters and is clamping down tonight. State Department correspondent Rich Edson has the latest. Across Venezuela, tens of thousands of protesters demanding President Nicolas Maduro get out. I have felt that people are believing again. Juan Guaido is the president of the opposition-led National Assembly. Earlier this week, he began a legal process to try to replace Maduro. And today... Juro. I swear to formally assume the powers of the national executive as president in charge of Venezuela. The United States agrees. This afternoon, the Trump administration officially recognized Guaido as the interim president of Venezuela. President Trump says, quote, I will continue to use the full weight of United States economic and diplomatic power to press for the restoration of Venezuelan democracy. We continue to hold the illegitimate Maduro regime directly responsible for any threats it may pose to the safety of the Venezuelan people. Maduro says he's breaking diplomatic relations with the U.S. and giving American diplomats 72 hours to leave the country. There's little indication Maduro plans to leave. We hope that Nicolas Maduro will accept a peaceful transition of power in Venezuela, that he will accept the will of the people to move his country forward uh, and embrace their new president. Juan Guaido. At the White House, when asked whether the U.S. would consider using military force there, President Trump refused to rule it out. We're not considering anything, but all options are on the table. Does that mean you're considering those? Which is all options, always, all options are on the table. Maduro's government dispatched police to the demonstrations. They fired rubber bullets and tear gas. Pro-government factions also organized counter-protests. The government that made Chavez, the government that has Maduro, now has achieved significant progress. The Trump administration encourages other governments to join the U.S. and recognize Guaido as Venezuela's legitimate leader. Maduro has called the opposition little boys under the control of the Trump administration. The United Nations says three million Venezuelans have left their country, escaping rampant inflation, food and medicine shortages and violence. Several U.S. allies in the region have joined the administration in recognizing Juan Guaido as interim president of Venezuela, though Venezuela's defense minister indicates the country's military is still behind Nicolas Maduro. Brett? Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thank you. The Kentucky high school student whose encounter with a Native American elder set off a viral video maelstrom says he meant no disrespect. His school has reopened after adding more security in the face of violent threats there. Correspondent Doug McKelway is in Covington, Kentucky tonight. Classes resumed at Covington Catholic High School today with all entrances and adjacent parking lots blocked by police to all but the school community. That is Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell for the first time joined other Kentucky lawmakers, Senator Rand Paul, Governor Matt Bevin, and Congressman Tom Massey in condemning the rush to judgment. In a matter of hours, these students were tried, convicted, and sentenced by the media where accuracy is irrelevant and the presumption of innocence does not exist. A presumption of innocence may be hard to reclaim in the social media age where standards are few as Covington student Grant Hillman is discovering. I've never heard such cruel things wished upon another human being. It ranges from getting locked inside a building and burned alive to sexually assaulted by the clergy members. It's It's just awful. In his first TV appearance, student Nick Sandman, the student behind the smile, explained his thinking as the standoff ensued. 
I'm not sure where he wanted to go. And if he wanted to walk past me, I would have let him go. I just wish he would have walked away. I knew as long as I kept my composure, it would hopefully die. The other man in the standoff, Nathan Phillips, the Native American activist, yesterday said he would like to meet with the Covington boys at their school. He told the Cincinnati Inquirer that Sandman, quote, did not apologize. And I believe there are intentional falsehoods in his testimony. But I have faith that human beings can use a moment like this to find a way to gain understanding from one another. The Catholic News Service reported today that last Saturday, the day after the march, Phillips and a group of about 20 tried to interrupt mass at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception with drum beats and chanting. A guard described the incident as, quote, very upsetting. Amid the controversy, lawyer Robert Barnes today delivered an ultimatum. Retract libelous attacks within 48 hours or be sued. That includes any major member of the media. That includes any major celebrity. That includes anybody with a substantial social media platform. Platform. If you've said anything false about these kids, they are willing to extend you a 48-hour time period, a period of grace consistent with their Christian faith, for you to, through confessions, get redemption and retract and correct and apologize. Shortly after that ultimatum, Congresswoman Ilhan Omar, newly elected Democrat of Minnesota, deleted a tweet in which she accused the boys of taunting five black men. She posted that tweet late last night, well after the narrative had been discredited. Brett? Doug, thank you. Lawyers for former Trump campaign chairman Paul Manafort are responding to allegations from the special counsel that Manafort lied to federal investigators and violated his plea agreement. His lawyers blame Manafort's faulty memory for any misstatements and say some of the errors were corrected immediately. The matter will be taken up by a federal judge this Friday. Federal judge is also hinting he may toss out a lawsuit against President Trump by adult film star Stormy Daniels. The suit seeks to tear up a hush money settlement over their alleged affair. The president has asked the judge to dem- dismiss the suit after agreeing to rescind the settlement that included a $130,000 payment to Daniels. While not specifically ruling in the case, the judge says it seems the president's lawyers achieved their goal of proving there are no grounds for a lawsuit. Part of the process for running for president is making amends for past positions, or so it seems for Democrats eyeing the White House this time. It's all about getting and staying on the good side of the ever more powerful progressive wing of the party. Tonight, correspondent Peter Ducey takes us inside what appears to be the 2020 apology tour. The current president rarely apologizes. And somebody said to me, one of the media, Mr. Trump, Would you apologize? I said, yes, I'll apologize to Pocahontas. But Democrats who may challenge him are kicking off campaign season by saying sorry. I'm deeply sorry. I know we haven't always gotten things right. I apologize. This cycle, the most motivated Democratic primary voters are the most progressive. So contenders whose records clash with progressive priorities are signaling they've changed. Like Joe Biden, whose history includes support of the 1994 crime bill that progressives blame for the mass incarceration of minorities. I've been in this fight for a long time. It goes not just to voting rights, it goes to the criminal justice system. I haven't always been right. Biden's long record also includes a stint as Senate Judiciary Committee chairman and now says he also regrets not objecting to the way colleagues strongly challenged Clarence Thomas accuser Anita Hill. I wish I could have done more to prevent those questions. Senator Bernie Sanders, who got more than 13 million primary votes in 2016, is also apologizing for not knowing some campaign staffers were accused of sexual misconduct. What they experienced was absolutely unacceptable. And certainly not what a progressive campaign or any campaign uh, should be about. Tulsi Gabbard says she's sorry, too, for previous condemnations of same-sex marriage. In my past, I said and believed things that were wrong. Not every possible contender is ready to say sorry for specific mistakes, including Michael Bloomberg, who spent years as a Republican and an independent. I can't stand up here and tell you that every decision I've made as mayor was perfect. There's no telling how primary voters will react to the latest round of regret among potential Trump challengers. But recent history shows it's possible to win a nomination by explaining away a moderate record. At least it is if you're a Republican. And I fought against long odds in a deep blue state, but I was a severely conservative Republican governor. There's an expression in pop culture, love means never having to say you're sorry. But this is politics, and these candidates are saying sorry because they want you to love them. Brett? 
<laughs> Peter, thanks. Up next, a drone forces another major airport to suspend flights. We'll take a look at a growing problem. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 10 in Phoenix, where police have a suspect in custody in the sexual assault of an inc incapacitated woman who gave birth to a baby. They say DNA testing of a nurse employed at the long-term care facility led to the arrest of this man, Nathan Sutherland. The 29-year-old victim had been incapacitated since the age of three and gave birth to a boy at the facility December 29th. Fox 13 in Tampa, where police say five people were fatally shot inside a bank today. The suspect is in custody, according to authorities. Initial negotiations failed. A SWAT team entered the bank to continue the talks, and the suspect eventually surrendered. This is a live look at Denver from Fox 31. The big story there tonight, public school teachers vote overwhelmingly to go on strike. They want an increase in base pay and more. It was show and tell time in Russia today when the military unveiled a new missile and released its specifications. The Russians say the land-based cruise missile conforms to the 1987 Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. The U.S. disagrees and has announced plans to abandon the INF Treaty. A face-to-face -face meeting between a U.S. ally and an American rival in Moscow today who called each other dear friend as they met to bargain over influence of parts of Syria. President Trump's decision to withdraw U.S. troops from the war-torn country has left them wanting more. Correspondent Trey Yanks reports from our Middle East newsroom. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Turkish President Tayyip Erdogan met today in Moscow to discuss the future control of northern Syria ahead of the U.S. troop withdrawal. With a pre-planned Turkish military offensive against U.S.-backed Kurdish fighters ready to begin with a single order from the country's president, there is international concern of major bloodshed among the Kurdish population. Right now, Turkey is demanding a 20-mile buffer zone inside Syria, giving its troops access to a potential flashpoint with Kurdish forces. With Turkey, Russia, Iran, and Syria all in close coordination, the United States was noticeably absent today in the talks about this buffer zone and other key regional issues. Our solidarity is actually a serious contribution to peace in the region. The three-way summit we started, the Syrian peace process, whether it was Sochi or or Ankara or Tehran. These were meetings that really held global interest. The meeting today comes as Russia's foreign ministry is warning Israel, one of America's closest allies, against conducting strikes targeting Iranian positions in Syria. Earlier this week, the Israeli Air Force reportedly bombed a series of Iranian targets in Syria, provoking an Iranian rocket being fired towards Israel's Mount Hermon ski resort near the Syrian border. In response, the Israelis bombed more Iranian positions. The practice of arbitrary strikes on the territory of a sovereign state, in this case we're talking about Syria, should be ruled out. With tension increasing between the Turks and the Kurds, and between the Israelis and the Iranians in Syria, the region is bracing for an escalation in violence. Brett? Trey Yanks in our Middle East newsroom. Trey, thanks. Up next, has the partial government shutdown had a direct impact on you or your family? We'll take a look. First, beyond our borders tonight, the chief operating officer at Facebook says the world's largest social network needs to earn back public trust. Sheryl Sandberg also said at the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, the company is investing billions of dollars a year to improve the security of its network. Striking Spanish taxi drivers are blocking access to a trade exhibition center in Madrid where a major tourism fair is being held. They're demanding more regulations for app-based ride hailing. Riot police have been deployed. And Pope Francis says the fear of migration is, quote, making us crazy. Pope is on a trip to Central America. He was responding to reporters who asked about the controversy over President Trump's promised border wall. The Pope has in the past called for, in his words, bridges, not walls. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. Top story at the bottom of the hour. If President Trump and Speaker Pelosi cannot agree to the date, time, or place for the State of the Union address, it's no wonder they can't agree on how to reopen the government. As the two sides jockey for position, IRS workers, FBI agents, TSA employees, among others, prepare for another missed paycheck. Tonight, correspondent, correspondent Jillian Turner reports, for those federal workers in the hundreds of thousands, there's nothing partial about the shutdown. 
From U.S. business to national security, even law enforcement, the partial shutdown is stretching beyond the federal government. The FBI Agents Association, repping 14,000 members, says the shutdown isn't just impacting individual employees. The failure to fund the FBI undermines essential FBI operations, such as those designated to combat crimes against children, drug and gang crimes, and terrorism. While Justice Department prosecutors say the nation's crime solvers are at a virtual standstill. DNA testing in some cases is not being timely performed. Some trial subpoenas are not being served. Crime investigations and grand jury panels are slowing down while perpetrators remain at large. The shutdown is also hurting the government's national security apparatus. At sea, the Coast Guard, the only branch of the military not receiving pay, says enough is enough. You, as members of the armed forces, should not be expected to shoulder this burden. New numbers from the TSA have experts predicting chaos in the friendly skies. Unscheduled absences among screeners are double what they were at this time last year, with employees using sick leave and reporting they're unable to work due to financial stress. In cyberspace, top cyber agencies warn the U.S. government is now more vulnerable to foreign hacks, terrorism, and cyber criminals than ever before. When it comes to American business, the hardest hit agencies in terms of personnel are the IRS, with a whopping 42 percent of staff furloughed. While it may not be America's favorite government agency, experts warn this could result in delayed 2018 rebates for millions of taxpayers. The Commerce Department, with 31 percent of its staff furloughed, has so far delayed publication of key economic data that companies rely on to make decisions, including figures for new home sales, housing construction, GDP, inflation, and personal income and spending. All these problems with the paper trail have real-life consequences for businesses large and small. Like this California wine bar left wrangling with a federal licensing and loan process that stalled indefinitely probably not going to order all of our supplies right away because we don't know if it is only going to be one month or six. So you can see the trickle down. Now tonight, the White House is asking for a list of government programs that will be impacted if the shutdown continues into March. The acting chief of staff, Mick Mulvaney, has tasked federal government agencies with providing their input to President Trump by no later than Friday. That's just two days, Brett. Jillian, thank you. Strong earnings reports from several big companies fueled a positive day on Wall Street today. The Dow gained 171. The S&P 500 was up six. The Nasdaq finished ahead five. Democratic Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas is stepping down from two major roles as she fights off criticism of her handling of a sexual assault claim by a former aide. Jackson Lee is giving up the chairmanship of a key House Judiciary Subcommittee. She's also resigning as chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. The move follows pressure from her colleagues over a lawsuit from a former employee who says Lee fired her after she complained about a sexual assault by a foundation employee. Lee's office denies any retaliation or mistreatment of that woman. It is the legal equivalent of a Hail Mary pass. Two New Orleans Saints fans are suing the NFL over the blown pass interference call in last Sunday's playoff game. The Saints lost to the Los Angeles Rams. The fans want a judge to order the NFL commissioner to replay the game or pick it up from the point of the foul. They cite a league rule that allows the commissioner to make such a move in the case of what is termed extraordinarily unfair acts. Flights at a major American airport grind to a halt after pilots report coming within feet of a drone. Though the penalties for flying drones near airports are stiff, the FAA says it gets reports of more than 100 illegal drones every single month. Correspondent David Lee Miller reports from New Jersey's Newark Airport. It's back to business at Newark Liberty Airport after two pilots nine miles out coming in for a landing reported seeing a drone flying in violation of federal law at 3,500 feet. For 30 minutes Tuesday evening, all landings at Newark were suspended. Aircraft at other airports heading to Newark were temporarily halted. It could have been much worse. Days before Christmas, multiple drone sightings at Gatwick Airport outside London resulted in more than a thousand flight cancellations and cost airlines an estimated $60 million. In the U.S., incidents involving drones and aircraft are on the rise. From February 2014 through April of last year, the FAA says there were more than 6,000 drone sightings near airports. Among them, 
November 2018, 15 miles from Boston's Logan Airport, a Delta flight encountered a drone only 300 feet lower in altitude. July 2018, San Francisco International, a drone is spotted on the tarmac. April 2018, Honolulu's Daniel K. Inouye Airport, pilots report two drone near misses. The University of Dayton, which simulated a mid-air collision between a drone and a commercial aircraft, found the consequences could be catastrophic. The drone is uh, not only plastics, but it's got metal parts in there, and those are stronger and have the ability, once they penetrate within the, the initial wing skin, uh, outer structure, they have the ability to penetrate further into the aircraft. The Trump administration is launching a pilot program to exclusively manage drone air traffic. It's a joint effort by NASA and the FAA. Brett? David Lee Miller at Newark. David Lee, thanks. The State of the Union speech has been uh, canceled by Nancy Pelosi because she doesn't want to hear the truth. We were planning on doing a really very important speech. Government is closed. We have said very clearly from the start uh, when I wrote to him the second time to say, since government is shut down, we do not let's let's work together on a mutually agreeable date when we can welcome you to the Capitol to get rid of the State of the Union address. I think that's a great blotch on the incredible country that we all love. It's a great, great, horrible mark. We'll do something in the alternative. Well, it started out that the president was saying, you know, I'm going forward with the invitation and I will deliver the State of the Union address in the House chamber uh, next Tuesday. But that didn't get far, a response from the House Speaker. If you look at our latest Fox News poll, where people in America seem to be on this, on the State of the Union speech, deliver as usual, 56 percent, skip altogether, 33 percent. But the Speaker's letter, soon after the president said he was going forward, when I extended the invitation on January 3rd for you to deliver the State of the Union address, it was on the mutually agreed upon date, January 29th. At that time, there was no thought that the government would still be shut down. In my further correspondence, January 16th, I said we should work together to find a mutually agreeable date when government has reopened, and I hope that we can still do that. I am writing to inform you that the House of Representatives will not consider a concurrent resolution authorizing the President's State of the Union address in the House chamber until government has opened. Where is this going? Let's bring in our panel. Jonah Goldberg, Senior Editor at National Review. Susan Page, Washington Bureau Chief at USA Today. And Molly Hemingway, Senior Editor at The Federalist. We debated how big a deal this was, you know, this back and forth. Uh, there's a lot of things happening around the world. But it is pretty unique, Jonah, for this moment in political history. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a great spectacle. Um, I think Donald Trump was right to call Nancy Pelosi's bluff on the security thing, because I always thought that was a fairly bogus and lame thing. If Nancy Pelosi doesn't want him there, he, she should stand up for institution and say so. I have a hard time believing, you know, when 10% of the American people are saying they're severely affected by the shutdown, according to this poll, that even a fraction of those people are really heartbroken that they may not see the State of the Union address. I think this is something that Washington cares about a great deal. If he gives a speech from someplace else, it will substitute just fine for it. Um, but it's just, I mean, I can't stand the State of the Union address, so I'm kind of glad to see it taken down a peg. But it, 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 is, it is a sign of the partisan breakdown in Washington. You're a so-to truther. I am. You just want the whole thing just... <laughs> I, 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 look, Woodrow Wilson is the guy who reinvented the thing about going to Congress. Woodrow Wilson is the worst president in American history, so I just want to leave it there. Okay. Uh, Susan, beyond this back and forth, it doesn't seem, if they can't get the address right, that there's any progress on dealing with the shutdown. Or like an infrastructure bill or anything else this year, right? I mean, one of the things that we see unfolding now is the way that these two powerful people who represent their parties are going to operate for the next two years. Uh, and I think it doesn't give you much hope on legislative action on anything or on a path to uh, opening the government. In fact, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's 33 days. The president's taking on the chin and polls, polls consistently show him down from December. And yet you don't even see urgent negotiations going on at this point. Right. Our poll, uh, let's see, Fox poll two, most responsible for the government shutdown. Uh, you're right. President Trump, 51 percent. Democrats in Congress, 34 percent. That matches uh, 
you know, other polls, what best describes the emergency major problem? Uh, and the government shutdown actually gets the most attention from people polled in our latest poll. Uh, here's some of the frustration in the House and Senate about all of this. I'm not saying that that's the right answer. I'm not saying that that's the best we can do. I'm not saying that's where the conversation ends. I'm asking my friends, when does the conversation begin? This is the first time in history that a Congress has ended in a government shutdown. And with all due respect to my friends, that's what you left us with. We are looking weak to the rest of the world. We are looking foolish to the rest of the world. Mine. You know, looking at some of these poll numbers is so interesting. You showed the one that has 51 percent of the country blames Trump for the shutdown, considering that he said he was willing to take full credit for it and that he thought border security and enforcement of our nation's laws and rule of law are so important. He's willing to shut the government down that it's only 51 percent, I think, speaks to some of this recalcitrance we're seeing where, you know, Nancy Pelosi says she couldn't even imagine that the government would still be shut down after this long. Yet she's done absolutely nothing to open it back up. She's offered one dollar for border security. I mean, that is not a serious person right now. There is a break, it seems. I mean, you have Clyburn and Steny Hoyer, others talking about border security a lot. There's an offer on the table of five point seven billion dollars, but it can't include a barrier or wall, they say. Even though barriers and walls are th are used to good effect in various places along the southern border. But doesn't border. there seem to be a crack in the Democratic position of non negotiating? You're seeing some people be how you'd expect adults to be saying, OK, you've offered this. We'd like to offer this, you know, slightly less attractive thing for you. And then you kind of start working. But again, when Nancy Pelosi has offered one dollar, that's what she thinks is her uh, is her powerful bid. And then to do all these antics. I mean, yeah, I agree. We've talked about the State of the Union not being a very uh, we, we might not like it. It is also an institution. I mean, it's particularly a modern institution. And to be the first speaker in history to get rid of this norm, to get rid of this thing, and then to complain about other people who are supposedly big norm breakers when you're the one who's actually destroying modern institutions, yeah. it undercuts a major I, I, Let point. me defend the State of the Union. I love the State of the <laughs> Union. It's, you've got both, you've got all of Congress, you've got the diplomatic corps, you have members of the Supreme Court, you have the press corps and the press gallery, you have invited guests in the, in the, in, uh, up in the galleries on the other side. I think it is a wonderful statement about our government, uh, our unity. Um, uh, I, th I, think, I think it's a wonderful institution. I love hearing what presidents have to say, what priorities they said, how the theatrics of Congress applauding. I am. I disagree with you. I'm pro I, State of the Union. And I think it's a monarchical carbuncle <laughs> on Republican values in that the President of the United States is not a king. I felt this way under Barack Obama. I feel that way under Donald Trump. We treat it as if he is the guy running the government when, in fact, the Congress is the supreme branch. On the norm violation thing, I think it's absolutely true that Speaker Pelosi is violating norms. But Donald Trump comes in bragging about how he's a disruptor. When you are a disruptor, other people react in disruptive ways as well. There are cascades and feedbacks in all of this. And I think that one of the things you talk to Democrats on the Hill, what they'll say is they are the negotiating. And I think it's absolutely true that the Trump White House has offered some perfectly reasonable negotiation tactics. They've moved positions the Democrats haven't. But that's in part because Nancy Pelosi is locked into this idea that what they don't want to do is credit this idea that you can shut down the government to get what you want from right. Congress. The, the hostage taking they talk about. They're talking past each other. And the, the hostage message was very prominent on Capitol Hill today. I want to just tick through a couple of these polls. Some people like polls as a snapshot of time. Other people hate them. We're going to show you what ours shows. Uh, Fox Poll 5, U.S.-Mexico border, build the wall, more border agents. Uh, and there you see the breakdown, build the wall, 43 percent. Um, and more border is in 73 uh, percent. Hardship, Jonah, you mentioned this, that your family's experience in the government shutdown, 10 percent severe, and there you see the breakdown. Obviously, for the 800,000 employees, they are feeling it directly. Uh, President Trump's job approval, we have it at 43 percent approve, 54 uh, percent disapprove. This tracks a little higher than some others. AP has it down in the 30s, I saw tonight. And uh, satisfied with the direction of the country, Molly, uh, down tick. 38% um, not in the right direction uh, from, from where it was.
Well, always interesting to know what makes people dissatisfied. Is it seeing things like the Covington High School kids getting totally trashed by the media and lied about and seeing that happen? Right, we don't have that visual held, in that poll, yeah. Held accountable? Or is it something else about the economy or so? You know, we don't know why they are not happy with the direction, but it could be any number of reasons. That's right. Panel to stand by. Next up, the Trump administration wades deep into the Venezuelan political turmoil. Ante Dios. I swear to formally assume the powers of the national executive as the president in charge of Venezuela. We hope that Nicolas Maduro will accept a peaceful transition of power in Venezuela, that he will accept the will of the people to move his country forward uh, and embrace their new president. A Juan Guaido. I have given the order to the foreign minister of the republic to initiate a total and absolute revision with the government of the United States of America. All options, always, all options are on the table. Well, the Trump administration, the president recognizing the head of the opposition party, Juan Guaido, as the leader of Venezuela. This is protests continued tonight on the streets so far. Uh, the wires are reporting seven people killed in protests today in Venezuela. Uh, we're back with the panel. A significant move, Susan, uh, when our country says, you know what, your president is not your president. It's this other guy. And very significant. And in this case, we have an issue of international relations on which we are not isolated. Canada, other countries in South America, are, Brazil, are agreeing that the, the, uh, the disputed president of Venezuela has to go. Now, Vice President Prince, Pence said he hopes that he'll get the message and leave peacefully. There are no signs that he's about to do that. Right. And he has a history, uh, Jonah, of, of cracking down. And we expect that to continue. Maybe even this opposition leader uh, possibly getting arrested. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure we're all quaking in our boots that they've cut off relations with us. I mean, this is a big deal. Now, um, it's a big problem, and one of the big problems also is the military, the leadership of which is completely corrupt and bought off by the Maduro regime, even if they would like to split with Maduro, the problem is, is that they may be complicit in all sorts of crimes against humanity, and so their fate is sort of tied up with keeping the Maduro regime going. The, the, the truth of it is, is it's, it's, Maduro is losing the support of the poor people who are staying behind, who have been his base. And if he loses those, it's going to be a people power thing. It's a prudential question for us. Morally, I think we're completely right. I think the Trump administration is completely right morally. But does our support for the opposition make it harder for the opposition or easier? And I just don't know the answer to this that. This is a big moment, though. Remember in the Obama administration when the Iran protests were happening, the Green Revolution, uh, the Obama administration chose not to weigh in on that. This is this administration putting its foot in there saying, this guy is not legitimate and we are standing with the opposition. Right. And speaking of State of the Unions, it was Monroe's seventh State of the Union where he issued that doctrine about caring about uh, making making sure that foreign actors don't get involved in this hemisphere. You know, when you're making a decision about whether to be involved in someone else's civil conflict, uh, generally speaking, you just want to only get involved if it affects your national interest. There's no question that this Maduro socialist government has destroyed the lives of its people. And that, that socialism doesn't work there. That there's a humanitarian crisis, economic